morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, this is um, uh, an initiative of uh, our center, which I will talk about a little bit, and also about uh, an initiative that was uh, set forth by, um, by Sergio Pantano and, uh, and friends uh, a couple of years ago, which is the um, SAMES, the South American Initiative on Molecular Simulation, which is um, that, that congregates uh, South American uh, investigators uh, in molecular simulation, especially in uh, biomolecular systems. And uh, we are very excited that this is uh, actually uh, taking off. And we hope to, you know, uh, reach uh, uh, um, cruise height and, 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 and actually fly off. Um, so uh, I will uh, spend, the meeting is very exciting. You have uh, several uh, very nice talks on different uh, subjects and also uh, hands-on uh, courses which um, we hope will uh, work uh, well. And I, at first I, I already uh, apologize for, uh, for some of the misorganization um, that uh, is entirely due to my fault. Uh, I, I want to spend just a couple of slides just to present to you the center that we are uh, running here at the University of Campinas. This is uh, one of these uh, research, innovation, and dissemination centers uh, funded by FAPESP. FAPESP is the, um, is the uh, Sao Paulo State uh, Research uh, Foundation. It's a very important uh, funding agency in Brazil, but it only funds uh, research uh, in the state of Sao Paulo due to uh, Sao Paulo state uh, contributors, uh, tax contributors. Uh, and there are 17 of these uh, new centers, and uh, these centers uh, are expected to, to carry high-level research, uh, tr technology transfer activities, uh, and also um, uh, dissemination and uh, science education activities. So um, our center is named uh, the Center for Computational Engineering and Sciences. Uh, the name sometimes causes some confusion because people think that we are engineers. And I say, yes, we are, but at an atomistic level, or molecular level, if you will. Um, but the center is, the, the idea is that uh, we hope to, 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 to establish a multidisciplinary center, and the center is dedicated to, develop, to the development and application of high performance and uh, data intensive uh, methods in a variety of computational uh, problems, uh, such as uh, molecular sciences, like ourselves, um, and the physicists, there are several uh, very high level uh, physics uh, going on uh, in this center. Uh, mechanical engineering, computational mechanical engineering. There is uh, also research in bioinformatics, computational biophysics, and of course computer science, which unites uh, us all. And the idea is that uh, not only research, but we're able to provide through this funding, uh, provide the, the necessary infrastructure uh, to carry out uh, uh, challenging research. That's the idea that, that we have. So uh, the center has uh, faculty from, usually from uh, Unicamp, uh, computer scientists, uh, physicists, uh, chemists, uh, uh, Leandro Martinez is here. Um, mechanical engineering, uh, two friends, uh, this one's are there, one, one of them is not in the country right now. Uh, and there's also uh, biology, and uh, this biology part here, there's uh, also uh, a, a connection with uh, one industry in the bioethanol uh, sector, which is already participating. And um, the uh, applied math math mathematicians, and also some international associates, uh, Dario Estrin uh, being uh, one of them, he will uh, arrive uh, the day after tomorrow, or tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So the idea, the underlying concept is that, you see, this is many disciplines involved, computational physics and chemistry, computational engineering, they work on finite element methods, boundary element methods, things related to the macrocosmos, right? Uh, not macrocosmos, but macro materials, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, macrocosmos from a molecular perspective, it's uh, really. Um, and uh, the computational bi uh, geophysicists, they, they work on actually uh, analyzing seismic data and um, different areas. So what, what really gather, um, what makes us join together here is uh, the high performance and the modeling and the data infrastructure that we, we, we hope to be able to provide. So one of the, our challenges is to increase 
uh, research in the boundaries so that we can do actually cross-disciplinary work. So this is the idea of the center. And we have fellowships sometimes um, and um, resources uh, to carry uh, uh, this um, uh, research. Things like, for instance, this workshop here that we have to, to be able to promote uh, every once uh, a year. So um, I was going to stop here. And, um, but I decided not to because uh, there's a very nice work that one of my postdocs is doing. And um, he's not here today because he's going to spend, uh, um, he's going to uh, Holland. Uh, he's going to work for uh, the competition, Steven Marink, right? And <laughs> the, well, Marink offered him a three year fellowship, so he's going to stay there. And today is Mother's Day in Brazil. So we are really workaholics here. I actually forgot that was Mother's Day when I put the data. So, that, so he's, he's not here. So since he's not going to present this, I, I, I wanted to present uh, some of this work. And I know that I'm already over you know, the schedule, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this work so that uh, we hope to get uh, also some input from you. So the, the Thematics here, or the team here, the, the, the topic that I want to, to, to tell here is about uh, uh, protein, ion, uh, and uh, gas uh, collision cross-section. Uh, why is this is, is important? Uh, because uh, we are thinking that uh, we are reinterpreting uh, data, experimental data on ion mobility mass spectrometry. And uh, this also helped, uh, uh, this provided us an opportunity to develop uh, some high performance uh, computing. So uh, we are interacting with uh, uh, people, experimental people that do uh, mass spectrometry data using um, um, ion, um, um, electron spray ionization and um, um, ion mobility uh, experiments. So this work was developed by Paulo Souza and uh, Leandro uh, Zanotto, who is also uh, our uh, um, software engineer uh, in the center. He also uh, helped, uh, did a lot of work uh, uh, on, the, on the software for that. Okay. So um, the idea here is the following. Everybody knows about uh, mass spectrometry. It's a technique where you generate ions, you accelerate ions, and uh, you pass the ions through an, a magnetic uh, set of fields, and you can uh, separate the beam according to the uh, mass charge ratio. Okay. So the idea is to use this type of experiments, that's what the uh, mass uh, spectrometry people uh, want to do. The, the, the ones that are trying to understand protein structure, they use this idea to, to analyze uh, large macromolecules, such as proteins, okay? So, and um, the idea is that, that they, they can, with very, very little amount of unpurified protein, they can uh, pass through this uh, mass spectrometer and they can analyze the different types of structure. Well, they hope that they, they can analyze some sort of type of structure, different types of structure based on the charge. At least they can separate and identify different uh, uh, mass to, to, to charge uh, ratio. So the idea here is that if they take one of these beams, separate it according to the uh, desired mass to, to charge ratio, uh, they can uh, send this beam through a, 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 a gas chamber such that they can accelerate this uh, gas chamber and then this is called a drift tube. And the idea is that they can separate the, the pulses. There are two structures here. One is an extended structure. The other one is like a, a more folded one. And um, the idea is that the extended protein structures will have a larger cross section and they will take longer to travel through the drift tube uh, because uh, of the uh, drag due to the friction due to the uh, gas, provided by the gas. Whereas uh, more compact uh, structures will fly through the tube uh, at higher speed and so the time of, uh, of travel is smaller and so they can look at the population and they can say, well, this, this high cross section means uh, um, lower time, 
slow, smaller cross section goes faster through the tube. So they, uh, analyzing these different types of uh, peaks, they hope to understand or to at least separate, well, this is the structure, this is a more extended structure, this is unfolded, this is folded, and, and so the, and that is the idea. Of course, these proteins here are charged. They have a net charge. Sometimes they have not just a single type of charge, but they have a charge distribution. They are, they, some of them may be zwitter ionic. Okay? So the, the idea here is, again, the, the same thing that I just mentioned. You have a drift tube. You apply a, a, an electric uh, field uh, here. And there is a gas there that is under certain temperature and pressure conditions. And then you go through the, you submit the ions here, the, 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 the protein ions, and, and then you detect them here. And you're looking at the drift time, you are able to, 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 to conclude the average collision cross-section. And so and this is the idea that I just mentioned. You have the friction due to the gas, you accelerate the ions, and then you can separate according to the uh, size, shape, uh, and interaction with the gas. So it's very important to interpret this data uh, to be able to understand what is the cross-section. What is the value of the cross-section of the certain structure with the gas? And, and then, once you have that, you can look, try to look at what is the structure that corresponds to that cross-section. Okay? So this is the idea. Okay? So, in addition to that, they also use something called uh, uh, cross-linkers. Okay? So in, in addition to submitting these protein ions through this uh, gas chamber, uh, drift chamber, they can also use um, uh, uh, cross-linkers, which are smaller, small molecules uh, with a certain length, and these molecules, they um, covalently bind to, usually to positive charges on the surface, usually lysines, but not just lysines, and, uh, and they do different types of, 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 of um, binding. They can have a, a strap conformation, which is like a, on a single helix, on a single substructure, uh, two different points. Uh, they can be in a bridge conformation where they contact um, residues that are far apart in terms of sequence, okay? <coughs> and uh, they can also be uh, in a dead-end uh, conformation. So the, just one of the ends is, uh, of the cross-linker is bound there. So they, they do this so that they can actually create some topological constraints. Um, Leandro has done very nice work on that. I'm not sure if he's going to talk about that. He's not going to talk about that. But... Um, um, some very nice work that's entirely different from what we, we're doing, but it's a much harder problem. But uh, he's younger and braver. So, so, and, and so the idea here is to try to, so what they do is they use these cross-linkers so that they can actually, uh, after they do the digestions, they can see which type of the, which residues are close to the other residues because of this, right? So they don't, they don't know the structure, but they say, well, this, this residue is near that residue because at, in the, under their digestion, uh, they came together. So with this, they, 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 they separate different fragments. No? They digest the proteins, they separate different fragments, and then they try to reinterpret this data. How the entire, they, they try to reinterpret, based on this data, they try to reinterpret, or to, not to reinterpret, but try to propose what type of structure and so the idea here is that they have a, 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 um, candidates, and they, they say, well, this candidate, can this be topologically connected? Yes, no, uh, based on this one. So the, and, and then they, they, can, they can separate out which type of structure corresponds to, I, corresponds to, uh, no. Can someone burn it? I'm feeling hot, are you? Yes. Sapajali gala jutras tamir pe favor. Okay. So this is the idea. So, but the question is, uh, are proteins really stable in gas phase conditions? We don't know. Uh, what is the charge distribu distribution uh, under, uh, under um, ion mobility uh, mass spectrometry conditions? We don't know that. Okay, um, and uh, are these estimates for cross-section, how reliable they are? Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, where we try to, to, to come in. Okay, so 
as a, a proof of example, proof of concept, let's say, uh, even for the experimentalists to try to understand the structure using this type of data, uh, they use a ubiquitin, which is a very, very well known structure. And um, so this is actually uh, the, the, uh, the cross-section distribution based on the time of flight, the experimentally determined. Uh, the black curves is the unmodified uh, protein structure. You see there are two types of distributions. And then you have uh, with, uh, with the different types of cross-linkers. And I won't go into detail what these different types of cross-linkers are, but one of them preserves the charge, the other one does not preserve the charge. Okay? The other one, uh, when it binds to a lysine, actually drops one positive charge uh, in the molecule. So it alters this, the, the, the charge state of the, of, of the protein. So, but uh, the idea, what, what they see here is that when they use um, cross-linkers, uh, cross uh, there is a shift to more compact structures. They want to try to understand why uh, is that so. And uh, our initial idea was, well, let's put this in water, let's put this in vacuum, let's compute the structure. We have a program that can compute the uh, collisional cross-section and see what comes out. And what came out was really completely nonsense. Way off the experimental data. Nothing actually converged. So this prompted Paulo to investigate better and try to mimic, try to reproduce the experimental conditions. Not just take protein in water, take protein in vacuum. We, we, we thought, well, protein in vacuum is going to denature. That part is going to extend this. And that's what experiments actually are interpreted. They say there's some helix, let's say, that's on the edge. I say, well, this one detaches and goes there. And, and, and this is a lot of uh, hand-waving arguments that uh, were nev nev never actually uh, seen, not even in simulations. So, um, so we try to, um, to mimic what are the, the, the ideas behind experimental data. So the three main assumptions of the approach is that first you have uh, electrospay ionization. This is in a water phase. They uh, ionize this and then uh, they dehydrate at a higher temperature and um, the protein goes through a certain ion guide which actually accelerate the, the ion particles. And then it enters the drift tube which is filled with uh, some gas like uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, sometimes now more recently uh, carbon dioxide, but mostly helium. Usually the former experiments mostly helium. In the industrial, industrial uh, uh, machines uh, these are usually helium or, or, or and, uh, so, uh, and so this is the, what's actually going on in the experiments. So uh, what, what, what we see here is that, well, uh, ubiquitin is in a folded conformation. After dehydration, there are many different types of charges, uh, uh, charge distributions that then can place. The charge is plus 6 or plus 7, but you may have uh, plus 6 how? It's uh, 10 positive ions and 4 negative ions or you can have uh, 6 positive ions and 0 negative ions and so on and so forth. And, and every charge distribution, not just the charge state but the charge distribution will contribute to the in electrostatic interactions and will, this will affect uh, or most likely will affect uh, the uh, conformation of the protein and, and therefore the, the, the cross section. Okay? So, the other thing is the collision with, uh, with uh, the gas. Okay? So they apply an electric field and these ions accelerate through the drift chamber and then the drift chamber uh, will collide with that and that's how they measure the cross-section, looking at the, the time delay along the, or the time, or travel time along the, 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 the tube, right? Okay, and the expression that I presented before. So, what Paulo did was to try to actually simulate this part here. So the first idea was he, he first took, he went there to the lab, looked at the apparatus, took the, got the measurements, so how, how large is the electric field, what's the range of the electric field, how they applied. So he can, using the mass and the charge, he can compute what is the final velocity of the beam uh, as it enters the gas, uh, the drift chamber. Okay, so the protein with uh, its charge, vacuum, 
enters the drift chamber with a certain velocity, you can compute the range of this velocity, known by the, 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 the range of the velocities, because he can, you know, he knows the, the electric field and, 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 the, and the potential that is applied to that bit. So what he'd look at is that first. So initially, as the beam or the protein enters the, the drift chamber, it collides violently with the gas. And every collision increases the internal temperature of the protein. Okay. So as it increases the temperature of the protein, if the collision energy is sufficiently high, the uh, protein structure is, um, um, is lost. It actually may actually, if it's sufficiently high, you can actually um, unfold the protein entirely. Okay. However, as it goes through the, the this is in the initial stage, as it, go, as it passes through the, 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 the drift chamber, there is a thermalization due to collision of the gas. So the gas is maintained at a certain temperature, and uh, every time a molecule hits the protein, it absorbs some of that energy. And what you see here, you see this is an actual uh, uh, a time history of the velocity of the protein. You can see that it suffers sudden drops. This is the center of mass translation of velocity. It suffers certain drops, various, and these are due to very energetic collisions due to the gas, uh, with the gas molecules. Okay. At a, at a, after several uh, uh, nanoseconds later, uh, it cools down, and then, and so, and this here is what we call the, this colli collisional annealing. Okay, so it's a thermalization, it's a cooling down of the protein uh, as you go uh, temperature. So what he did is that at this part here, he looked at this structure. Okay, so what are these structure at this region here? Okay, after it has gone through the uh, drift chamber. So this here takes very fast. So the the, the actual uh, measurement time of flight is taking place here the protein when the protein is traveling this uh, section of the tube it, it's already uh, in this uh, sort of a uh, regime here so uh, he changes uh, the temperature can be as high as uh, some 500 degrees and this will depend on the initial uh, collision energy uh, at the entrance of this tube so with that he can compute for Every during the trajectory, every population, different types of, he does that many, thousands of simulations like that. Thousands of simulations like that, and compute the cross-section, okay? And then he can have uh, different cross-sections for different uh, collision energies and different charge states, okay? So he can compute that, and he can also compute uh, native contacts and, and all these structural indicators of this protein. He can, he can calculate and he can monitor, and then I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but, but the average of the, of the, of, on this section here of the trajectory, they use to compute uh, all these properties, and the most important here is this uh, collision cross-section. So here is, here are the results for the uh, cross-section uh, with, uh, in the absence of cross-linker, in the presence of different types of cross-linkers, and under different types of collision energy. You see that you, as you increase the collision energy, the peaks unfold into more substructures. Uh, and this is because it, it hits, it denatures, but as it cool down, cools down after the, um, the during the, um, the um, annealing process, uh, it may fold into different types of structures. Okay. So he can, he can have, there are several types of these, uh, types of, uh, of uh, the peaks are different and he can examine the structure corresponding to, to every, uh, over every uh, peak in this distribution. So he can go back there and see, well, when this is the gas phase, when there's a low uh, collision energy, what's going on, when, when there is just zwitterionic ions, let's say, and, and, and then you have that, and, uh, and other types of collisions. So he can identify the structures with the different peaks. Okay? So he can actually not only compute the cross-section, but he can tell you, well, the structure of that peak corresponds to that, that sort of globular thing. And this happens in vacuum. So this is an, a, a misfolded thing, right? And it's misfolded because it's in vacuum. There's nothing else to it to interact with. And so it folds whatever 
And, and here, here is what, where the charge plays an important role. Okay, or well, the charge distribution plays an important role. Okay, so he can not only compute the, 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 the cross section, but he can also um, look at the structure and see what the cross sections correspond to. So, and, and he can examine not only the, the role of the charge distribution, but also the effect of the uh, cross linkers. So, the cross linker provides a mechanical restriction, fine, but the, uh, the, the charge distribution creates different types of interactions with the, uh, with the gas, okay? Because of the charge different states. And um, that part of the paper I didn't read, so I don't think I can explain that. Oh, well, well, see, yes, uh, the mechanical restrictions you're seeing here, the mechanical restrictions, depending, because there are many places where the cross linkers can link to. And uh, the experimentalists don't know, they, they know it's only a, a lysine, but they don't know where. There are many, many lysines. But so, and there are many different possibilities for, uh, for the cross-linking to bind to. So they, uh, Paulo had to do different types, binding to different places, trying to, uh, to understand it. So he did like, uh, I don't know, uh, tens of thousands of simulations like that. Okay. And uh, oh, where? well, no, sorry. It's missing the most important part. <laughs> it's missing the most important part. Uh, I wanted to show, well, uh, there's an important slide missing here. <laughs> so embarrassing. Is the slide where we compare with the, the unmodified ubiquitin, the, the, the distribution of cross sections, where we compare this, where the experiments are, ah, yeah. We compare these things here, unmodified, unmodified with different types of ligands. We compare this with the results that we obtain from here. So just, we don't know the populations. So you, you, you do some sort of a two parameter fitting. Main peaks, main, the main contributors, uh, it's a certain population of that, a certain population of that one. And you reproduce the experimental profile beautifully, okay? With a small shift here and there, because uh, it's a, this, this experimental data is also very dirty. So, I mean, the experimental data is not dirty, but the road to it is kind of dirty, because you have to do lots of calibration and all sorts of things. But the match between the computed and the experimental data is beautiful. It could only be possible because of this uh, uh, ingenious, uh, actually try to look at very carefully, try to reproduce the experiments. A and uh, the interpretation is also very important. So here, to finalize, because I'm way over the board, uh, just to how we compute this uh, collision cross-section? There's a, a code that does that, written in 1996. It's called the MobCal. Uh, it's very old code, very, very slow. Lots of go-to statements, right, Leandro? Really, you know, it's an in-house thing, not, not ours. It's somebody else, it's a famous program, actually. Uh, and the idea is the following. Here you have your macromolecule, and here's the colliding gas. So what you have to do is you can uh, actually estimate the cross-section here very simply looking at the shadow of this. What is the average size of this molecule? And then you just like project on a shadow, you can, you can compute this cross-section. This is very naive. However, the interactions with, of the gas molecules with this macromolecule here, here is very different. Sometimes the gas molecule even hits and binds to certain pockets. So it's not some, just not com computing the, the shadow. Uh, you actually have to uh, get this molecule, um, collide with different velocities and different par uh, impact parameters, going here or going right head on collision, different velocities, your your gas phase. And not only that, you have to do this many, many times, but you also have to sample for orientation of your target molecule, okay? Different orientations, hitting different velocities, different uh, impact parameters, different configurations. Once you do that, you can compute this integral, 
and uh, you have the, uh, the average cross-section. So the idea here is that not only take that into account, but also you take that for different conformations. You take this along the trajectory, right? So you have 50,000 conformations that you have to rotate to. So Paul spent like two years doing that, the machine only for himself, uh, one, of the co one, of the, one of the older um, clusters. Um, and, 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 and so uh, when uh, uh, Leandro um, Zanotto came to our group as our uh, um, um, code engineering or our programmer engineering, uh, he worked very closely with Paulo and uh, tried to improve this program. So they rewrote the program entirely using C. Uh, and um, what they did uh, is there are different methods. This is the, the, the um, uh, trajectory um, uh, method, which is the one that we are going to use. It's the most important one. Um, and the idea is that they not only rewrote this code, but they make it parallel. They parallelize the code. Why? Because the, uh, the idea, this is a very simple code to parallelize. I mean, it's not a very simple code to parallelize. It's a, it's a, it's a, the idea is very parallelizable, if you will, because you have different uh, uh, collisions, different orientations. So you can distribute this uh, over the uh, different processors, and you, you can that, do that. So, the, the, so th this is working very, very well. And it's not uh, in a CUDA version yet. Um, uh, Leandro is working to put that on a CUDA version. And more, we can actually do different gases, not just helium. Because you can, uh, so the protein you rotate, but the gas, it's, uh, you have to actually look at the different orientations of the gas. So this is very complicated. So what we want to do is, the, since it's a CO2, nitrogen, or something very simple, we want to use a um, Leonard Jones plus embedded multipole models. So you have a dipole, you have a quadrupole, so that the inter you only have to look at the trajectories regarding the center of mass, and the, the rotation of the solvent, of the solvent molecule uh, is taken care of the, by the integration of the uh, multipolar uh, interaction, so that you don't have to, to deal with uh, rotations of the, the so uh, the initial versions uh, already dropped uh, several uh, times. Uh, you can do these calculations before. Every single calculation took like uh, three and a half hours. Uh, now this, in a single node, uh, takes only six and a half minutes. So imagine now what can we do? We can take every protein in the data bank and run this and create a database of collision or cross-section, which is very important for people that are doing mass spectrometry uh, <coughs> experiments. They want to know what is this cross-section, what is the, what is the, 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 the uh, this protein, what would be the cross-section? Without having to do all that, without having to do all that, all that, without having to do all that, we can just get to a single point here for uh, a given structure. Okay, so we can do that. And uh, Leandro is working now on this to not only to, 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 to perhaps uh, extend this to every protein in the data bank, but uh, inspired by, um, um, by Sergio Pantano's uh, suggestion, uh, we also have the PDB for the Zika virus. And it's hopeless trying to use, to compute the cross section for such a large uh, uh, macro objects such as a virus um, uh, using uh, the earlier version of MobCal. But this one here can, be, and they actually, th this is a useful information for them, for, for many people in the area. They want to know what is the cross section of this virus, of that virus. So we hope that we are, will be able to compute this in a reasonable amount of time uh, using the new uh, implementation. Okay? So, in conclusions, um, that's what I want to tell. We, can, uh, we have a, a new code for computing cross-section, fine. But not only that, we have a new way of interpreting the uh, ion mobility uh, mass spectrometry data. And, and this is the most important part from the protein structure uh, aspect. Okay? And uh, 
I have to thank uh, Fabio Gozo from our uh, institute. Uh, he's an uh, excellent uh, experimentalist on mass uh, spectrometry, has a very nice lab. Alexandre Gomes, who did uh, his postdoc with him, uh, now is in this uh, mass uh, MS um, company called the Waters. We hope we'll be able to sell them the code so that they can put the code, yeah, they can actually put the code into their packages of program, right? You can compute cross-section here. You just give me the PDB and, okay. And uh, Alana Dos Reis was a former student uh, from uh, Fabio's uh, group. Okay, all right. And I have to thank Alejandro, and I have to thank uh, Paulo, who is not here, uh, is spending Mother's Day with mom. Okay, all right. That's what I wanted to tell you, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yes, Marisa, perfect. Oh, uh, that was very nice. I have, I have a question, maybe uh, I don't know very much about the experiment, but uh, the oh. charge thing, uh, the charge you get is from the ionization of the residues, or those are from the ionizable residues, I mean the ones that take uh, those are No, they know the charge state for sure. Of the whole system? Yes, of the whole system. They don't know where the charge, where the charges are, but they know they, they know exactly the the mass to to charge ratio. And how, how do you do to generate the configuration? There are lots of there are lots of possible configurations. Yes, yes, the yes. They usually they don't the, exper the the experimental papers when you read them they don't mention at all. They say the charge is plus six. And they don't, there's a controversy, you know, some issue saying, oh, is it zooterionic or non zooterionic Is the charge distribution important? They actually, they can, I cannot usually address that. So in our case, we consider different types of charge distribution, where the residues are. Yeah. But exactly that's the point. Do you consider when you're charge something, the ionizable residues, or you consider ionization No, no, the, uh, uh, um, don't know, I have to ask Paulo, but I think it's the ionizable, but, yeah, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not every residue, there are certain residues that are ionized. Can I ask another question? Yeah, I hope I can answer the second one. Yes. Yes. And obviously, small molecules have a very small integration range. What kind of integration range and uh, and grid do you have for? Oh, it's it's in the paper. I don't know, but it's it's huge. Also, we can do small molecules really fast, really fast. We are actually trying to. This is if we if we have a postdoc or somebody to do this, we can. Compute cross sections for um, um, several types of uh, molecules of interest to mass spectrometry, but this can be done really fast, much faster than, than mob call. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sergio. Yes, a lot of phosphate. <laughs> so I, I wonder um, if you try different force fields, because in, in, in at a certain point in your presentation, yes. uh, proteins will unfold uh, in vacuum, which is reasonably true. My, my, my question was uh, whether the force fields will unfold the proteins, um, yes. because the force fields we have perhaps are not so good to work in, in, vacuum. in vacuum. Yes, this we the the another thing that we are. Uh, working is to implement the code to make it general to different types of force field. You just insert the right types of, uh, of files, uh, topology, force fields, and you can choose from force fields. Um, the fact, the thing, the assumption that proteins will unfold in vacuum is 
they will perhaps lose some of the folding, but usually what we see is that they get more compact, not denatured, more compact. They have nothing to interact with, except themselves. It's that... Okay. If no, one, one question, oh, yes. When the protein is flying on the, uh, in the chamber, yes. one imagines that the, the, the protein will orient itself with the smaller cross-section along the, the moving direction. It, 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 yes. That, it, that's it, taking it, into account in order to compute the comparison with the external data, or how it doesn't... It, it, if, if it's an extended object, if it is, it, it will it will come into the the drift chamber like this, yeah. right? And as it, it collides, it will tend to align, right? Okay, and uh, so that will that is is taken into account when you do the calculations. You don't have to worry about the way it goes. It, it, if it aligns, that's, it, the, that's the cross section. That's cross section that's going to be measured. Yeah. Okay.